exit Nevada and enter California. Today is a hot and dry day driving all around to the wonders of magnificent Death Valley National Park, one of the most extraordinary places you can visit on Earth. We made it through the night at Mizpah Hotel with virtually no paranormal visitations. We were actually hoping to do some gambling down in the lobby this morning. We are in Nevada after all. But the person who oversees the machines wasn't in yet and they wouldn't let us touch him. However, at the Giggle Springs gas station next door, their machines were beeping and flashing and all ready for us. We felt luck was on our side. We each put in five dollars and started playing poker. After a few minutes, we quit while we were ahead and had both won enough that we were instructed to go get the money from the clerk. I kept waiting for the catch, but there was none. The lady actually gave us actual money for actually doing nothing. Paid for our gas. And that was our last view of Tonopah. Now it's just a drive down US Highway 95 through bleak rural Nevada towards Death Valley, which means more moody and curious, and for a while cloudy, landscapes but there may be sunny skies ahead. The best part was when we saw twisty little shapes on the hillsides at one point and realized that yes, these are Joshua trees, just like we saw in Joshua Tree National Park on day six. They don't just grow there, this is 250 miles away to the north. Great to see our weird old friends again. I was inspired to listen to you too in the car. Recently I said that Black Canyon of the Gunnison had maybe the best name of any national park. Well perhaps I was hasty. Death Valley. Doesn't get any more punk than that. Formerly a national monument, Death Valley became a national park in 1994 and is the biggest in the lower 48 states. And it's almost entirely in California, meaning we're back in the state that started this whole trip. The National Park actually contains numerous mountain ranges and valleys and formations. Death is just the name of one of the main valleys. This one, the famous one with the white floor. Our first stop was Furnace Creek Visitor Center. It was here at Furnace Creek that in 1934, the hottest air temperature ever recorded on Earth occurred, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. In June, it's usually in the 90s or worse. I'd say our luck was continuing today. The visitor center boasts of Death Valley's superlatives. Hottest place on Earth. Driest and lowest place in the United States. Eighth lowest place on Earth. It's exciting and kind of daunting to be in such a spectacularly unforgiving land. Unlike Nevada, though, you give money, not take it here. Oh well. Dehydration is a threat in Death Valley, for anyone, and for us especially. The visitor center sells lunch packs designed to help guard against the loss of minerals and fluids. My blood sugar was 171, a tad high, but reasonable. Time for a turkey sandwich full of sodium. The park brochure is great from a design point of view, but for the first time I can remember on this trip, it gives literally no explanation of the natural or even human history of the park. The map on the back is fantastic, but the front is just some poetic flights of fancy to set the mood. The actual story is that the park encompasses a motley collection of landscapes with impressive views and names. Black Mountains, Owl's Head Mountains, Last Chance Canyon, Funeral Mountains, Eureka Sand Dunes, Death Valley, Saline Valley, and many, many more. The area also has a history of mining and of human hardship, and most of all, the indefinable romance of peculiar new discoveries, maybe about oneself, to be made amid the inscrutable rocks and the endless arid valleys. Our first highlight in Death Valley was Zabriskie Point. I've always known of this place because the movie Zabriskie Point was filmed here, and Pink Floyd, one of my favorite bands, did music for it. Great. Extracurricular activities. Like what? The famously strange and beautiful badlands here are eroded sentiments from a lake which dried up five million years ago, before there even was a Death Valley. 
The humps and folds of tan rocks with their colorful highlights are one of the park's most iconic images. It is here, by the way, that the front cover of U2's famous Joshua Tree album was shot, despite there being no Joshua Trees anywhere nearby. And that's me on my first ever cross-country road trip, actually wearing a Pink Floyd shirt, I think. And here I am on this trip, not wearing a Pink Floyd shirt. Zabriskie Point was named for one Christian Brevoort Zabriskie, who owned a borax mining company in the early 1900s. He'd transport the borax out of Death Valley using so-called 20-mule teams, which were actually made up of 18 mules and two horses who went along with it. They gave their name to our next spot, 20 Mule Team Canyon. There's a dusty little dirt path through some crazy yellow hills and around peculiar salty rock formations. Nothing else like it. Up another side road, a paved one, is Dante's View. From up here, across the valley, you can easily see Telescope Peak, the park's highest at 11,000 feet above sea level. And down below, way below, mineral-filled Badwater Basin, the lowest part of Death Valley. You can really start to see the reason for this park's ethereal, otherworldly reputation. Dante's view is 5,400 feet above sea level, and as you drive back down, you see not only bizarre new colors and shapes around every curve, but the elevation drops quickly. It shoots down to zero and doesn't stop there. Now below sea level, we were driving further down to Badwater. The road here is unnerving, dry and dusty and long flanked on one side by mountains that manage to be monochromatic and colorful at the same time, and on the other side by a vast sea of crusty salt. Bad water is 282 feet below sea level. The air is usually so hot and dry here that even if there were a lake 30 miles long and 12 feet deep, it would evaporate in a year. Although actually there was a bit of water pooled here today or maybe someone melted. Despite the comparatively mild temperature today, bad water was bright and hot. Constantly sipping a mix of Gatorade and water, we left North America's lowest point and went to my favorite part of Death Valley, Artist Drive. I fell totally in love with this road, a narrow one-way path of dark asphalt winding through picturesque hills and rocks that I couldn't believe. I wish I could include all 30 minutes of dashcam footage from this road in this video, but I'll try to contain myself. The point of Artist Drive is this spot, halfway along the path, Artist Palette. Ancient volcanic eruptions scattered metals like iron, magnesium, and titanium, and the heat oxidized them into bizarre colors. Absolutely stunning and unique.
All right, I'm gonna have to let this footage run a little bit. I just love the shapes and the colors and the surprises around each bend. This is one of my very favorite pieces of driving on the whole road trip. By the time you get back to the main road from Artist Drive, you feel you're getting to know this amazing region and its varied characteristics better. As the sun started lowering and the shadows were getting longer and longer, we had one more part of Death Valley National Park to see on our way out, the western section towards Panamint Valley. First, Devil's Cornfield is made up of arrowwood plants, whose roots keep the soil together even when the wind blows everything else away, so they end up on their own little private pedestals. Native Americans use these plants, as the name suggests, to make arrows. And down the road is our last highlight in Death Valley National Park, Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes, surrounded by mountains and legendary for their graceful shadows and mesquite trees, which bend and twist on purpose to avoid being buried. Outside the National Park, the road itself becomes the star attraction, winding through hills and opening up into wide, quirky, colorful views. A few miles ahead on this road is the actual spot where you 2 took the photo for the back cover of their Joshua Tree album. But that tree has since died. Anyway, we turned before it, onto the even smaller Panamint Valley Road. At times, this was barely a road. Maceo took a nap while I played some music. For Pink Floyd and I, the experience of Death Valley continued to echo as the sun set, very slowly, over the ridges and across the fields. Some of the very best driving in America. At last we made it to the small town of Inyukern and our room at the Mayfair. Inyukern is a town of fewer than a thousand people in the high desert, and is the place with the most sunlight of any spot on the North American continent, 355 sunny days a year. Our motel was a pleasant little place with very friendly, or at least curious, staff. The perfect spot to relax after Death Valley. We stayed at the Mayfair in Inukern for two nights and spent day 69 resting and sorting photos and stuff. Also, the car has been needing service, so we took it to a garage in nearby Ridgecrest, recommended by the helpful as always Enterprise office there.
With everything done and us refreshed after the exertions of Death Valley, the day ended with a great meal at Bernardino's, right next to our motel, in this most unusual and fascinating corner of America. Tomorrow we have a surprisingly varied and scenic drive through the winding mountains, golden hills, and bountiful citrus groves of California to a cheery place called Lindsay.